Hi, I'm Diane Marie D.M. Collins. And I'm Danielle Hampson. And, and we, we are, are the Chicklets on The Author Show. And today we are visiting with Rodney Barker, a former weekly editor of a newspaper and a journalist and also an author of Hiroshima Maidens. Welcome, Rodney. Thank you for having me. Um, Hiroshima Maidens, you and I talked a little off camera. This is a book that was written in 1985 the first time. Talk to me a little bit about the synopsis of it. Well, let me just say this is 2015. Um, the book came out 30 years ago on the 40th anniversary of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. And it was a significant book because it told a story of a unique group of survivors of Hiroshima. These were young Japanese girls who were disfigured in the atomic bombing, who were brought to America 10 years after the war for reconstructive and plastic surgery. And this was a, a humanitarian effort that happened. Yeah, yeah. And it was exciting, don't you think, Danny, how it happened? I think it is, indeed. But I, what I would like to know is what got you interested in, to in this topic in the first place? Good question. Um, <laughs> when I was nine years old, I was living in Connecticut outside New York City, and I was raised in a Quaker family and the Quakers were involved in post-war humanitarian projects. And it just so happened that when this project that brought these young Japanese women to America for reconstructive surgery took place, they had to house the women in the homes of families around the city. And our family had two of the women staying in our house. So I was nine years old when two of the Hiroshima maidens became my quote unquote sisters. Oh my goodness. Oh, wow, that must have been what an impact on yeah. you. But still, what started you? What was the spark then to write this book, to well, tell their story? Yeah, I had this unique experience when I was nine years old, and then I went on about my life, um, as did these women. Um, and then I went on, and actually, when the women were at the house, we would have journalists come and interview them at the time. And I would sit in on those interviews and listen to their stories and to the questions asked by journalists. And that kind of pointed me in the direction of journalism. And it was some number of years, in the early 80s later, that I was writing magazine articles and um, got in conversation and with some people. And I told them about the maidens. No one had ever heard of them. Oh, no. So I realized it was an untold story and that I thought I was the one to tell it. <laughs> so how did you research the whole book? Um, went to the libraries, see what had been written, and very little had been written. After the women went back to Japan, they had all but disappeared as a group. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, and then I applied for a grant, and I received a grant to travel over to Japan and write for various newspapers. And then I stayed longer after the terms of the grant were over to research and meet the women. How long did you stay in Japan? Yeah, about three or four months the first time, and then I went back a second time. Did you stay strictly in Tokyo, or did you go around? I went, I went through Tokyo. I stayed in Hiroshima. Oh, you stayed in Hiroshima. And, and I want to know, is did you keep in touch with any of the women after your parents' experience with them? And you were nine, but I mean, was there any way that you had a starting point to find them? Well, I, there was a man who organized this whole project. His name was Norman Cousins, and he was the editor of a magazine called the Saturday Review at the time. And I got in touch with him, and um, he was my sort of link to the maidens. But as well, a number of these women had stayed in touch with host families. We had received Christmas cards, things like that, from the maidens. Um, so when I went back over there, the sort of a reunion took place. <laughs> and there was reasons why they had not talked to the press since that time. Um, and that because of my personal connection, they were willing to talk to me, and that's how I was able to write the story. What did they share with you as, as to their reasons for not? I mean, I know they were still very shy about, and as the custom is different too, and their faces and the disfigurement, but mm. what did they share? Well, you have to remember, these were 25 women that were just selected by the fact that they were outside in the city at that time when the bomb went off. So you got 25 different personalities who are inclined to different ways of doing things. Some of them became activists afterwards. Some of them came back to America. They couldn't readjust to life in Japan. Wow. And for some, just to lead ordinary lives was a form of victory. Um, so they all went in different directions. And one of my challenges writing, actually, <laughs> you have 25 women. How do you tell 25 different stories? And so I had to narrow it down to three or four that I thought were connected to the America and tell their stories in depth and detail. Are any of these women still alive by any chance? Yeah, there are about 16 still alive today. Um, I just checked on that, as a matter yeah. of fact, um, <laughs> because uh, it's been a number of years here. Um, and are you still in touch with them? I'm in touch with several of them. Several of the ones that I focused on in depth and detail in the book have passed away. You told me off camera a particular story, which is, to me, a great human story about a particular Japanese woman. Can you share that with us a little bit? <laughs> well, I mean, the, although there was a passport to them that came from my personal background and connection to them, 
that didn't mean that when we sat down and talked in detail and depth about their experiences that they were necessarily open. And I felt that it was important to sort of to sort of portray the complexity of what it meant to maybe be struck by lightning twice, first by the bomb, then by then coming to the enemy country for help. And so in talking to them individually, I had to establish a rapport to allow them to feel comfortable talking in detail um, about their experiences. And I think what you're referring to is one of the women um, who was one of the youngest women at the time. Mm -hmm. So when I was doing interviews with her, she was probably in her early 40s. And one of the things that she expressed to me was her disappointment in not being able to have love interests in her life because, because, of, of, her disfigurement. because of her disfigurement. Right. And so I felt, as well as sort of extracting her story, I wanted to give something back to her. So I encouraged her to think, to think of herself as, you know, as the interior beauty, not to be concerned about the exterior, and that there was certainly there would be men, because that was important to her, who would be able to relate to her in that way. Right. And over the course of the series of, of interviews with her, um, I began to realize that she was looking at me as possibly that <laughs> person who could that give romance, that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it was it was a complex situation because I wanted to encourage that sense of self. By the same token, I did not want to sort of get involved. I thought right. that would compromise the whole Absolutely. project, all Surely. that kind of a thing. So it was one of those those difficult human situations that one gets into, and ultimately I had to make a choice. And the choice was um, clearly with the book and um, to maintain the objectivity and independence even though it was an awkward situation, yeah. it was a little bit hurtful. Is she still alive as well? Yes. Good. Well, hopefully she moved on and that's what I like. She you has. and I also talked a little bit about um, how this affects us in this contemporary world. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, this is a story that really works on two levels. It dramatizes the human effects of nuclear weapons. I mean, these women became the symbols of the face of the bomb. And this is the, the best you could ex expect. They survived it. They can some, some of them are available to, alive today. But on the same token, it's a great humanitarian story um, of the enemy country, if you will, America, America. reaching out, sure. gesture of compassion. And so it works in that level too. And I think that these, these kinds of stories need to be kept alive. And so I'm thrilled that we're, it's going to be re-released as an e-book. Oh, how exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And this is one of those stories that I really feel that should be part of our national memory. Right. And yeah. keeping it alive and available to generations who have not heard about it, don't know about it. Well, it is a moment of history that, that is not just the day it happened. It, 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 it lasted for decades, and it probably will last for more decades. Well, it, it's, it's affecting us today That's and how right. we look at the world and how we treat our other countries and everything. It's just how the world revolves is around this one story of that bomb that dropped August 6th, 1945. But this story is on the other side showing how we have suddenly looked at that enemy and said, no, you're just a human. It's a story of wisdom and inspiration that should be kept alive. Totally. So you mentioned the ebook. Where can we find it? Okay. This book, as well as the other books that I've written that all deal with serious themes, could be found on my website, www.rodneybarkerauthor.com. Oh, Rodney Barker Easy Authors. enough. Yeah. Easy. Thank yeah. you so much. You. And you have been visiting with the author, Rodney Barker, and we are The, the Checklist. Come back soon.